Good day, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining today's edition of Taneo Insights. I'm Kevin Kajiwara in New York. Paul Ryan is with me today. He was the 54th Speaker of the United States House of Representatives. When he inherited that position from John Boehner in 2015, he became the youngest speaker in almost 150 years before handing the gavel over to Nancy Pelosi in 2019. Previously, he was the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, and before that, from 2011 to 2015, the chairman of the House Budget Committee. He was first elected to Congress at the age of 28, representing the first district of the state of Wisconsin. And of course, in 2012, he was the Republican Party's vice presidential nominee when he was Mitt Romney's running mate. In addition, he is the, he's on the board of directors of the Fox Corporation, of Shine Medical Technologies, of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. He is a professor at the University of Notre Dame. He is a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and he is vice chairman of Teneo. Speaker Ryan, thanks very much thanks for, for joining me to be here today. I guess I want to start because we are now 26 days out from the midterm elections, although voting is well underway in numerous okay. states. Um, I think the audience would love to hear what your sort of current read is, you know, uh, with this many weeks out. Um, I think the conventional wisdom is, is that the Republicans are going to pick something up with like a 20 handle um, uh, on the, uh, in the House. Um, Senate is 50-50, as we know, it's going to be very tight. but. Um, you know, what do you, uh, what do you see? Yeah, I think uh, that's about forward? right. Uh, you can't say the cake is baked 26 days out, but it's partially baked. I think, I think the House majority is pretty baked. Uh, it may not be a 20 handle. It could be as low as 15, but my guess is that it is a 20 handle. But with the way redistricting works and the fact that we already have, you know, we're sub five seats from the majority, we're not going to pick up 63 seats like we did in 2010. It'll be more like 15 to 25, maybe 30 on the outlier. A 30 seat pickup is an incredibly good night for us. Probably not that high. In the Senate, like you say, I think it's 50-50. It basically depends on turnout and, and candidate performance in the closing days here. Now, the headlines will be what they will, but I believe that the post-war <coughs> average in the midterm would be a, you know, a 27, 27 seats, yeah. I believe, unless the sitting president is below 50% approval ratings, and then it's more like 35. Yeah. So yeah. when you're talking about a number of 15 to 25, the headline will be Republicans retake control of the House. But in your view, is that then a is that a disappointing night? Or 15 how should you interpret that? Yeah, because the way I look at it from having run the place, I want an operational majority. I want a functional majority. And if Kevin, uh, if Kevin McCarthy has, you know, a single digit majority, that's kind of inoperational, frankly. It's really, really hard to run a majority that way. He'll technically have a majority. Very, very difficult. He needs a double digit number to have enough of a vote cushion to do the things he's going to have to do. And he'll have to do things that are not easy to pass. It's just inevitable yeah. with majorities. And so the bigger the vote cushion, the better he can operate his majority. And uh, he needs double digits to make that, to get a little breathing room. So can we can we unpack this a little bit? Maybe we'll start with the uh, start with the Senate because I think there's a fewer number of seats that are really going to kind yeah. of determine yeah. this. Although it feels like we're at a you know, given how tight it is, almost any Senate seat could uh, could could determine this. But um, you know, it looks like Pennsylvania, Georgia, Nevada, really the key key states here, and then throw in yeah, North Carolina, Ohio, Wisconsin, Wisconsin and, and Arizona yeah. and Missouri in there. Um, I feel really good about Missouri. I feel pretty good about Ohio. Uh, I feel very good about Nevada, not as good about Arizona. Pennsylvania is trending better than it was before. Um, I feel good about Wisconsin, my, my state, my senator. Um, and there's some weird outliers, like uh, interesting candidates that we have in Washington state and in Colorado. We have some pretty interesting candidates that, you know, on a really good night, you never know. Uh, but, but in a few of those states that we ought to win, they're, getting, they're closer than they otherwise should be. So. Talk a bit about, about in particular, the, the House, because you've kind of um, alluded to this fact that it could be really anywhere between 15 and, you know, if, if you had a, a dream night, it would be 30, yeah. um, 30 seats. But, but walk us through how you're kind of reading that right now. And I, and I do wonder, you know, if it's, uh, if it's a really tight majority, as you suggested, there was a possibility it could be. Is it, is it axiomatic that McCarthy takes the speakership? I guess you, you would know as well yeah. as anybody. No, no, that I've spent a lot of time yeah. on this stuff. Uh, what you do that night is you watch time zones and, and election laws as to when polls close. And that gives you 
a matrix of districts to watch, typically East Coast going over to West Coast. Some polls close a little earlier than others. And then you just, you have your sort of matrix to, to fill in your seats, the seats you bank, the seats you, you know, expect to win, and then the, the close ones. And that kind of gives you the, the trend. So sometime during that evening, you have a pretty good sense of where you are. Um, some of these are going to be pretty close in the suburban districts that it may take a day or two or three to find out where this all shakes out. So you're asking about Kevin becoming speaker. Yes. Um, that is, if, if it's a double digit majority, it's a layup, no brainer, no big deal. Uh, he'll get it, and, he, and nobody plays this this sort of, I'd say, inside member management game better than Kevin McCarthy. Um, he and I are, are good friends. We divided our labor really well. I was more of a policy guy. He was more of a politics guy, and we complemented each other's skill sets quite well. Uh, and so I would say on the vote counting member management um, side, he's extremely good at that. So I would never count Kevin out on these things. When you get down to a single digit, a minority, no matter who is running for speaker, it can get dicey. It can get difficult. There can be odd members with odd requests, with odd agendas that can just make it a little more complicated. But if anybody's going to figure that Rubik's Cube out, it's going to be Kevin McCarthy. So it yeah. seems to me that we're looking at one of the kind of, it's, it's a particularly strange uh, election cycle this time uh, yeah. around in some ways, yeah. right? I mean, the... Yes, because we have Trump hanging out over us. Well, so I mean, this is what I'm... Yeah, yeah I'm, 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 I wanted to ask you where you kind of think the electorate, I mean, to the extent that you can talk about the electorate as a as a monolithic body, but I mean, when you look at the when you look at the polling trends out there and what's on top of people's yeah. minds and what is sort of swaying them right now, is it, you know, is it a Biden, you know, normally the, the, the midterm is a referendum on the sitting president. Right. But it seems that it's also a, a referendum on the former president to a degree. It's unusual to have something as seismic as, say, um, the abortion decision by the Supreme Court come in the middle of that, uh, of that cycle. So, you know, um, but of course, beyond that, economy typically yeah. really, really key. A third yeah. of voters say that's the number one um, agenda item for them and if they're likely to vote you know then it's you know it, it, it that really favors republicans right now because they're highly 100 uh, highly favored um right. or or seem to be a better steward of the economy but as you kind of look at the lay of the land of the electorate what do you see yeah so into this? i think the difference is going to be these suburban districts it's so so we will do extremely well in what in our rural blue collar collar districts Democrats will do well as they usually do in their urban districts. So the suburban voter is going to be the difference making voter. So I said 15 to 25 seat. I think that 10 seat delta is basically a bunch of suburban voters in suburban districts that will determine, you know, whether we have a big, nice vote cushion or a very narrow majority. And then the question is what's on the front of mind of those voters. And so it's obviously in the Democrats interest to have it be, you know, abortion and Trump. It's in our interest to have it be the, your economic circumstances and the, and the policies that, you know, arguably got us there. Um, I think right now the polling is showing it's more economics than anything else. That's why the Democrats are going to do everything they can to make it about Trump. Um, he is the Democrats' weapon against us. He's a cudgel against us, especially in our swing districts. So the question is, is he in the news, in the know, in front of our faces on TV, you know, 10, 5, two days out or not? Or are we having more economic news shoes drop? Another inflation number, another un unemployment number, a uh, PPI number, or something like that that just gets this economic news really rolling. That's the question that I have in my mind for this, this last, what, 26 days. Right, and given that, I mean, how would you, I'm gonna take a little, little journey here. I mean, how would you kind of characterize the economy right now? We're in this sort of unusual situation yeah. where the Fed is raising rates aggressively, inflation is there, yet job creation remains pretty impressive. Yeah, it wasn't bad. And, I mean, 261 you know, was the last number. Yeah, that was a pretty yeah, good number. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, it's not like people are losing yeah. their jobs, and yet a pretty sizable percentage of the electorate thinks that we're actually in a recession already. Um, how, what's your view on the current state of the economy? I think we're definitely heading toward a recession. Uh, I think it's pretty hard to avoid it. I think partly because you have what I would argue is bad fiscal policy from the, from the fiscal policy authorities, which is Congress and the president. And then that means the monetary policy authorities, the Fed, will have to do all of the job of getting rid of inflation. They realize that this snuck up under their watch. They were late to the game to, to get rid of it. I think their models 
weren't very good, and they sort of missed inflation. They don't really have a good theory of inflation. So now with their dual mandate, they realize inflation's the problem. It's not employment. Clearly, with that jobs number you just we just discussed, the Fed is not going to think they have an employment problem. They're going to continue to think they have an inflation problem. So they're going to have to whack demand down as best they can with more rates. I can't imagine not having another 75 basis point increase the next next yep. FOMC. And it sounds like the neutral rate's going to be like 5% instead of 4.25%. And that's going to be, you know, in the next year and a half. I don't know exactly what the timeline is. But the Fed's forward guidance is showing us they're not going to get to 2% target rate for, until 2025. So that just tells us they are going to be pushing things down. They're going to be pushing down demand. And right now, with, with the fiscal policy we have, there's no help coming from there. Maybe divided government will get us a little bit of respite because we won't have new tax increase threats or more um, inflationary spending coming. So that gives us a little bit of a pause in what I would call bad inflationary fiscal policy, but still means Jay Powell and the Fed is going to have to do basically all of the job. So I don't see how we get out of this without a recession, frankly. Should the <clears throat> should the Fed view 2% inflation target yes, as they should. sacrosanct? Yes. It, it would be really unsettling, very troubling, if they start weasel wording this even more. They weasel worded it already. 2% was approximate, literal. Now, if they say we're going we're gonna to shift to two and a half or three, big mistake, big mistake. It, uh, their credibility would go out the window if that happened. I, Jay knows this, I think. So, look, a lot of, I know a lot of people who are, who are a little exposed on debt. A lot of people who are out there on the, on the risk curve, on their, on their debt structure, mm -hmm. are kind of freaking out about this. Yeah. I understand that. But the alternative, just so you know, for the average American citizen, for, for a husband and wife living in Janesville, Wisconsin, living on a fixed income, Going to 3% means we will debase your currency by 30% over the next decade. We're already doing it by 20%. I mean, I don't think that's a great signal government should send its people. Right. That we're going to erode the purchasing power of your hard-earned dollars by tens of percentage points over, over a decade. That's kind of ridiculous, in my opinion, frankly. So do you think, I mean, considering that we're 26 days out from the election, considering that the electorate favors the Republicans on stewardship of, of the economy. And it's true that, um, you know, abortion as a, as a key issue has, you know, has doubled um, sure. in the last year or whatever. Yeah. But, these, but, but things like health care, uh, abortion, the, the environment, even crime, guns, all those things are actually way down. I mean, they, 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 they represent much smaller percentages than, say, the economy does. That's so right. 26 days out, I know you said it's not baked in. But what can change? I mean, can any of... Yeah, there's always some exogenous shock that happens that shocks people. Uh, some kind of an economic crisis, some kind of a national security crisis, something. It, it just happens. Look, I can go back to the 2012 election and talk about the hurricane that we had right before the election and it threw things off. There's always something that happens in October. That's why they call them October surprises. So it's not far-fetched to think with about a month to go something's going to happen that's going to alter the trajectory. But I think we pretty much have a baked in trajectory. That's why I feel very confident in saying we're going to get the house. I'd be yeah. shocked if we didn't get the house. Part of it is because of the retirements. Uh, the yeah. Democrats were, were polling really poorly about a year ago when members of Congress had their filing deadlines. They had to decide, do I run for re-election or not? If I don't think we're going to be in the majority next term, do I really want to be in the minority? A lot of members thought this is when they reached far too left, tried far to do far too much without operating majorities, which was, right. to me, political malpractice on Biden's part. A lot of senior members of Congress in swing seats that knew they were going to have tough re-elections decided, ah, forget it, I'm, I'm retiring. So you had a massive retirements. That's done. That's baked in. You can't reverse that. So that is why I feel confident in saying we're going to pick up a bunch of seats because it's so much easier to win an open seat than to take out an incumbent. So many incumbents have left. So we have more open seats we can get. And I think because of just the general atmosphere, we should get those seats. So just to, just to finish up on the economy here real quick, um, it seems as if, uh, you know, again, barring some sort of major surprise, the headwinds are going to continue to build, yeah. and that does not advantage the, uh, the Democrats. And in fact, one of the most recent bits of, you know, data points on this is, is the OPEC Plus decision last yeah. week yeah. Um, to cut another 2 million barrels of, of, of production. It seemed to take the White House by, not necessarily surprised, I think they probably factored in that that was a possibility, but it was certainly annoying. I, my question for you is on this front. 
you know, um, is, is the, do you see an evolution? How, how do you, representing the other party, view, um, you know, that kind of, um, that kind of a decision by well, erstwhile allies? First of all, two things come to my mind, which is Biden has terrible energy policy. We could do so much for ourselves, for our consumers, for inflation, for our allies by opening up oil and gas production. Open up federal lands, open up OCS, Outer Continental Shelf, allow gas pipelines to be built. By the way, gas is clean. Glass is the, gas is the best bridge fuel to get into a carbon-free future. We're, what, do we want to ruin our economy in pursuit of a carbon-free future, or do we want to have a good transition where we don't dislocate the poor? I mean, it seems like a pretty obvious choice in my mind. But unfortunately, the administration has chosen to sort of strangle American domestic production, bad domestic policy, bad politics, bad um, foreign policy. It may be good for, you know, Democrat Party politics, but it's bad for everything else. That's the first thing that comes to my mind. The second thing that comes to my mind is the Saudis. It's not just the Saudis. Look, I think everybody thinks we're going to recession. So you, I think you have to take some of their decisions at face value, which is there isn't always a conspiracy behind every corner. You know, maybe they're thinking about we don't like Joe Biden. He criticized us, yada, yada, yada. But the fact is their entire economy, their entire budget is largely based on revenue from hydrocarbons, from oil and gas. So if they know we're going to recession, which d re reduces demand, reduces revenue to their coffers, wouldn't they want to sort of store up a little bit? Wouldn't they want to plus up a little bit of a surplus right now in anticipation of going into a recession, not knowing how long it's going to be? That's kind of a rational decision. So when, when politicians tee off on the Saudis for conspiratorial reasons or say reckless things like Dick Durbin saying this regime shouldn't exist anymore, that stuff's really ridiculous. It's irresponsible. And I think we should just take a, all ch should take a chill pill here, relax. Those countries are gonna do what they think is in their best interest. And that's, uh, that's, that's the way the world works. So that's why we should do what's in our best interest. And that means to me, make ourselves less dependent on OPEC. We are the largest exporter of oil and gas and we can, we can produce more and get ourselves off of this dependency in OPEC. By opening things up, we can change the future markets today. But Biden's choosing, choosing not to do that. And I think that's a big mistake. So I wanna go back to something you said a minute ago, which was the, you, you highlighted the, the number of retirees um, mm -hmm. in, in, in the house. And anytime you've got you know, any type of an organization where people have been around for a long time and they leave, a lot of institutional knowledge, a lot of yeah. parliamentary expertise yeah. and whatnot walks out, the, walks out the door. How does, you know, when you have a big shift like that, a lot of freshmen, um, how does that impact the, the institution? And how does that impact particularly then, you know, um, in the sort of the setup that you're talking about, Kevin McCarthy and what his, you know, what his conference is going to essentially look like. How is that, is that gonna be a rambunctious bunch or how is, how it usually easily, is. I, mean, I know he's a great whip, so yeah. question. It usually is, uh, but knowing Kevin, he's spent a lot of time with these people in their districts who are running right now already. So it's not as if they're, they're gonna first meet him when they show up in DC. They're, they will have already known him. Uh, I never kind of ran around the country quite that much. It just wasn't my thing. Um, it will be a rambunctious bunch, but what happens is a new member of Congress typically realizes I have my strong opinions and thoughts, but um, I'm gonna figure this place out, take some time to do it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be deferential to the people who preceded me, who are in my party, who ha share my principles and values, and, and, I, and, and listen to them. That, there is a bit of deference that is always paid at the beginning of a new session with a new majority. I would expect that to be the case here. I, w I was in the majority, then the minority, then the majority again, saw it you know, back and forth as a member, as a staffer as well. There is a bit of deference that's paid up front, but you're right, you are reducing uh, a lot of the experience. One of the reasons I was drafted as speaker, I wasn't running for the job, is because by the time 2015 rolled around, I was one of the old guys. I was one of the experienced people. I was, yeah. I'd already been chair of two committees. I ran nationwide on, on a ticket. So people kind of came to me as one of the more experienced hands to, to lead the place. Um, and that, that what, what I mean is then people usually coalesce around experienced wise leaders to help guide the place. And the, the smart leaders also tap into the enthusiasm and the excitement of the new people and try and create a nice blend. A nice blend of enthusiasm, fresh perspective from voters, 
along with tempered wisdom of people who know how to get things done, how the system works, to try and you know move the place in a constructive direction. That's Kevin's charge. That's right. his challenge. I think, and he knows how to do it. So I, I have a re reason to believe he'll put it together. So do you think that it's fair to say that <clears throat> if the Senate remains in Democratic hands, um, that one of the reasons it will do so is because some of the candidates yeah. were not <laughs> totally. great candidates yeah. and they should have been better, right? And so, but you know, <clears throat> we're in this election cycle, we're 26 days out, it is, you know, the candidates are who the candidates are. When you look forward though, I mean, it feels to me like, you know, and I know you've, you've, you've made this point in, in a lot of conversations we've, we've been in or I've seen you speak, you know, that there's a, there's kind of, there's a difference, right? There are people who are in Congress to kind of audition for their post-Congress show on Fox or MSN, MSNBC, depending on what side of the aisle they're on. Um, and then there are those who are kind of, kind of quiet and who are serious about legislating. But it occurs to me that we have on both sides of the aisle some just deeply unserious people um, in Congress right now. And yet, you have just gone through a litany of challenges that we have, both in terms of our foreign policy, economic policy, social policy, social cohesion in this country. How do we get in an environment where the things aren't going to change are social media yeah. and a disaggregated and fragmented, you know, and, and very kind of openly hostile yeah. media? Yeah. How do we get A-list talent back into really in the numbers that we truly need um, to lead in, in Washington? I really wish I had a great answer to that question. I don't know that I do. Uh, it's something I think about a lot, actually. Um, when I started in Congress, it was just, you know, actually, when I was a young guy, I... Uh, I looked at the House and I said, who are the really most successful legislators? I'm going to go ask them to go to lunch or breakfast, get advice from them. You know, the guy who gave me the best advice is Barney Frank. Because, you know, I knew he was a damn good legislator. And I just asked him to go to breakfast. And, yeah. he, you know, I was this young 20-year-old freshman Republican conservative. And he gave me really good advice. Uh, I mean, I don't agree with him on many things. But, but he, he gave me this phrase back then. And it was like my first month, my first term. He said, there are beers and doers here. People want to be somebody, people want to do something. You gotta ask yourself which one you want to be. And I want to be a doer. And then he gave me good advice on how to go about doing that. Mm -hmm. And he was actually really an insightful guy. Then I, then I watched us go from having beers and doers to having workhorses and show horses. Now I call it entertainers and legislators. So we have a bunch of entertainers on both parties who are trying to scale this quick hit entertainment wing of the party, curate your brand, be the most you know conservative or progressive people you person you can be relative to everybody else, and show that you're better and just go with the solo act. And then there are the, the legislators who understand the founders gave us a system with two parties, two chambers, and and three separate but equal branches of government that require negotiating and compromising and settling differences and 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 you know making things work. We have fewer legislators than you know than we used to. We still have them. And the question is, will we have the kind of leadership, and it may just be a few people, not many people, that can kind of calm the situation down, calm the country down, go over the heads of the entertainers and communicate to the, communicate to the country, we have serious problems we've got to solve in this country. We have a lot of agreement on many basic things in this country. Let's agree on what we agree on and let's solve these problems and move forward. I think the country is going to be more hungry for this as time goes on than less. And so I speak in hockey terms because I've come from Wisconsin. Right now, everybody is skating to where the puck is right now. That is, fight a culture war, be a hardcore progressive, be a hardcore, you know, entertaining conservative. And, and that's where you'll get fame and fortune and whatever. But I think we're going to have some polarization fatigue. We're going to have some, some gridlock fatigue because these problems are going to mount. We're going into a recession. That's going to be pretty ugly. I would like to think the puck is going to be somewhere else in a, in in hopefully one, two, three, four, five years. And, and the best politician is the one who skates to where the puck is going to be, which is be an inspirational, unifying, centralizing figure that, that is a proven problem solver that the country says, I'm sick of nothing getting done. I'm sick of all this polarization. I actually don't hate the person who lives across the street from me or looks differently than me as, as I'm told to hate. I want someone solving these problems. I think that's... I, I pray and hope and do think that's where we will end up. Uh, we, we solve these problems at the end of the day in America, usually kind of ugly, but we solve them. You know, look, I'm a conservative, so I'm a big fan of Reagan. 
A Reagan 2.0, not a Trump 2.0, is the leader that I think we need and want in this country. Democrats could say something on, on their equivalent, but that's the way I see it. And do you see those people out there? I do. I do. I do see some people out there like that. I mean, you know, it, it, because I do. or how many election cycles do yeah, you think how it'll take, it's to, take to get there? I think part of it depends on just how bad things get. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a recession can do a lot to, to focus the mind. And, and then if some foreign policy fiascos and, you know, some other things in between. Look, my biggest fear is, is our fiscal problems, uh, our debt crisis, interest rates, the dollar is reserve currency. I've got a book coming out at AEI on this topic in a couple months. My worry is that we, we don't start really solving these problems while we can do it on our own terms and our own timeline. And it gets so late that it gets really ugly. Right. That's my biggest concern is that we can't fix these sort of big problems that are solvable today, but aren't being solved because our politics are not up to the task. And that we, but we miss this window to solve them in a good way. And then it's, it's ugly, radical budget surgery, political surgery, you know, when it's, when it's already kind of past time. Do you think that, I mean, you know, you're, you're in some ways you're alluding to the, 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 the types of populist kind of candidates that, yeah. we, that we get. And clearly, populism is something that not only the United States suffers had it from. It's a, it's a big issue in a lot of democracies in the world uh, right now and in non-democracies, of course. Um, but I do wonder when you look back at moments of you know deep polarization where populists you know were in the ascendancy, it feels like um, the and you, you're kind of suggesting this I think, but it feels like oftentimes the catalyst is a pretty traumatic one for yeah. for the country and we've gone through some things like the financial yeah. global financial mm -hmm. crisis certainly like covid and whatnot that were major challenges to us as an entire population that only served to you know widen uh the polarization gap and and so on rather than bring That's us right. together right. as a as a country yeah i think democracy is being stress tested in two basic ways one from within with our polarization our inability to get out on our problems and solve these things. That's democracy writ large. That's the knock on us by the tyrannical dictators like Xi and Putin. The other way is we're being challenged from without, from tyrannical dictators like Xi and Putin. Um, I think it's more of a China thing, which is sort of these ubiquitous tyrannical surveillance states are, think that they're leaner, meaner, and they can make better decisions. Um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, I think it's a false conceit and it's a fatal conceit on their part, I think. And I believe that the power and the beauty of our freedom and our liberty and our ability to be self-determining and, and the innovation and the entrepreneurship that comes with that ultimately prevails at the end of the day. But that is if we're not hamstrung by not getting over some of our bigger structural problems, like our debts, like our deficits, like our currency problems, immigration, other you know, important issues that need to be solved that if and when we do solve them, we're going to do great. We're going to be fine. Um, so the question is, can we rally ourselves in a self-determining way through our democracy without these, you know, other countries trying to tear us apart? Uh, and can we heal ourselves and, and rally ourselves to some unifying principles and visions um, because we really appreciate the gift we have, which is our freedom, and, and, and make sure that we can solve these problems before you know, it gets ahead of us. It, yeah. I mean, you know, China and certainly Russia may not be convincing anybody that, they're, that their <clears throat> systems are superior to ours, but it does seem like the message that they are sending throughout the, you know, throughout the non-aligned or call it the global south, whatever you want to call it, <clears throat> is to put on an endless loop pictures of American kind yeah. of chaos, right? Yeah. Let's put January 6th up there. Let's put Antifa up there. Let's put, you know, Uvalde up there in Buffalo. And like, let's just keep putting that stuff on endless loop and at least suggest to the world that, you know, you know maybe America is not quite as great as they tell you, and maybe that, for, therefore, the delta between how bad we are yeah, and that's how great job. they are. Their so, job is to say they're they, just as bad as we are. That's what Putin always does that. And yeah. our sort of our soft power, if you will, is somewhat being eroded successfully right now, do you think? Well, I think part of that is to um, tame their domestic populations and make them think it's not, the grass isn't so green on the other side. They have their own problems. That, that, that's more for domestic consumption, I think. I guess, I guess to me the biggest question in my mind's eye is in the race for um, preserving freedom and, a lot, and disallowing it from being overtaken is really a technology race. This is what I mean when I, when I was talking earlier about quantum computing, 
yeah. artificial intelligence, yeah. the kinds of key technologies that unlock free futures or lock up free futures, that can really you know hack cryptography, that can really make nation states extremely powerful in attacking other free people. That is something that we, America and the entire free world, have to win this race in order to preserve our liberties and our freedoms. And I think, I, I take brand freedom over brand tyranny any day. And I think if we, can, if we can extol the virtues of these things, lead in this, I think we can help sell freedom to the rest of the world who truly would want it and does like it. I'm not talking about some idealistic, you know, um, neocon here. I'm just saying in, in a realistic way, I think th th our brand, freedom and self-determination, is better than the alternative. And the question is, can we muster the political unification in our political systems to tackle the big sort of challenges we have in front of us uh, so that we can overcome those and, and preserve our freedom and our, and our liberties? I think we will. But it's just going to be a clumsy road and a bumpy road from here to there. You know, you bring up something that's really interesting. You talk about some of these technologies like quantum computing um, a, a, as an example. And while we've got an enormous, um, you know, entrepreneurial spirit, we have enormous ability to direct capital on uh, the right ideas here. Um, and we've got, you know, very effective higher institutions of higher learning mm -hmm. and whatnot. But these investments, especially because they've got um, a, a, a national security element to them, require enormous investments. And I know, you know, we're up against an adversary for wh 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 where, you know, um, even ar erstwhile public companies are extensions of the foreign and economic policy yeah. of the country. Um, I know industrial policy is kind of a four letter word, so to speak, in, in this country, but what's the right balance if we're going to win I, in those? I think the balance between, you know, bad industrial policy, crony capitalism is the difference between basic and applied research. I think the government's job and role is to finance basic scientific research that would not otherwise be done by commercial enterprises to get the precursor, to get the basics, so that then for-profit you know, entities can take that basic research and apply um, applied research to it and commercialize them and allow the incentive profit, allow you know, the innovation that comes with free markets and free enterprise to finish the job and take it all the way home. I mean, Google is way ahead on AI. Than, than any other Japanese or Ch Chinese SOE. So we're already, we're, we're, we're leading in AI and it's because we have hyperscales that are investing in this. And you know, you may not like hyperscales, but would you rather they be, you know, Chinese hyperscales or yeah. American? So I think, I, think, I think the free market system produces better results. And part of the, the value of the free market system is we have a basic scientific research, which we do need to invest in that then is taken by applied. It's when you have the SOE, the, the Chinese Communist Party and these state-owned enterprises try to command and control all of this that I don't think it's, I don't think that model works as well. Right. And I think, we'll, I think we'll win this one at the end of the day. So a good example of what you're talking about that, that's practical that we've already actually experienced would be like Project um, Warp Speed. Yeah, to, perfect example, uh, right? Yeah. perfect example. Um, Basic research, commercialized technologies, and, and, a, and, a, and a profit incentive yeah and regulatory relief, so we got government out of the way of, of risk taking and experimenting and took risk away and liability protection, and bam, we banged this thing out. There's no way another country was gonna give us a vaccine for COVID right. as fast as we did for, and gave it to the rest of the world. Let science and the market determine that, that winner. Do you think the world would be a different place today or do you think it was ever even possible given the, 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 the domestic situation that he confronts uh, and, and the worldview that he has that Xi Jinping ever would have said, you know what, Pfizer and Moderna have, pr have, have, have produced the state of the art, yeah. I'm gonna buy five billion doses of that and I'm gonna reopen my economy. I, I don't think he'll do that. I don't think, he, I don't think it's in his wiring. I don't think, he, um, I don't think it's in his real, real, real view and I think he would think that would be, have to be a major, major concession to um, an adversary that he would not be willing to make. Okay, so I want to come back to the election here for a second. So you talked about the <clears throat> doer workhorse legislators. Yeah. And I know, as you know, so let's assume for a second that the kind of the baseline scenario uh, that you laid out at the beginning of our conversation prevails. Uh, I know you've spoken fairly highly of, uh, of Kevin McCarthy's leadership, but as you look at some of the other uh, people who are going to assume mm -hmm. the chairmanships of yeah. the, of the yeah. um, committees that are <clears throat> investigatory or and, and, and those that are really critical to the economy and the functioning of business in the economy. 
are the people who are going to assume those roles, do they, do they fit your your template, or Mixed are we, back. yeah. I don't know if I want to, I mean, these, I mean, these guys are all talk, people I know very yeah. well. I, I want to talk a little bit about what you expect the agenda to be, okay. I guess. So, you know? on the policy making front, I think, um, talking about new technology, Web3 and blockchain is, is a new technology that has a lot of regulatory uncertainty. A new law will have to be written to give this, this industry the ability to, to, to grow in America. Patrick McHenry will be the chairman of the Financial Services Committee a great policymaker, a total workhorse, who I think will, with the Biden administration, write a good law. That, that's my prediction. Um, I can go down the list of committees. You ask about, um, it's funny, the committees that do a lot of this investigating aren't typically the committees that do all the legislating policy-wise. The Armed Services Committee, it'll be run by, again, Mike Rogers, and he will continue the 54th, I think, in a row, bipartisan tradition of having a bipartisan National Defense Authorization Act. Mike Turner will be a great Intelligence Committee chair focusing on a buttressing Americans' intelligence community. Yeah, I can go on and on. J Jamie Comer and, and, and Jim Jordan will run the um, Oversight Committee and the Judiciary Committee. Those committees will do oversight. Those committees will do the hearings. The, the, the hearings you'll see on you know, Hunter Biden and stuff like that will probably come from those two committees because that's frankly their jurisdiction and that's that's those the committees that do the investigating the show trials that you you're used to seeing come from certain committees yeah. and the people who go on those committees want to do those things right and so they'll be doing those things the people who i went on ways and means committee because i wanted to do tax policy and welfare policy and trade policy policy so it, the way it works in congress is you pick your path and what you like to do and what your strong suit is is where you typically end up and that's what you do and that's why you'll see sort of a mosaic of activities in Congress, policy leadership, policy making, oversight, and yes, politics. You just brought up the National Defense Authorization Act, and yeah. it looks like the sort of controversial <clears throat> Taiwan uh, Policy Act yeah. will likely get folded into that. Ultimately, do you feel confident that that um, you know as that is as that's worked through, that some of the more sort of uh, very provocative elements of the, of yeah. the original act will get will get watered down. I, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to it. It, it. I've been involved with lots of those little disputes. It's always the administration, which has what I'd say kind of a cooling saucer view on foreign policy. You know, a bigger, well-rounded view on foreign policy tries to temper the passions in Congress, and then negotiates with Congress. The thing is, with that bill, it almost always passes with a veto override-proof majority. So the administration has less leverage on a bill like that than they typically do. Yeah. A lot of times they'll say, I'm gonna veto that bill. And then you say, well, okay, what do, you need to, what do I need to do so you don't veto the bill because I can't override your veto. And that gives the administration tons of leverage. I don't think they'll have that kind of leverage in this case. So then it's really power of persuasion. It's honestly, can Joe Biden convince Adam Smith, um, and I don't know who Hask chair is in, um, Jack Reed, I think. I think it's Jack Reed in, the, in this, I could be wrong in the Senate. Can Joe Biden convince two chairmen in his majority, in his party, not to do this or that? That's the right. question. Right. So, um, and, and with regards to the Russia-Ukraine war, obviously the United States has, has been, you know, taking the lead um, in terms of not only the diplomatic efforts uh, against Russia, but obviously um, the constant supply and resupply uh, of the Ukrainians, both financially uh, as well as with material, military materiel. Um, do you expect that that will continue with yes. a change in in hundred percent, I do. So the leadership will be, will see that yes. as critically important. Yeah. Okay. No, no, Republican leaders will absolutely back the play. Just look at the vote counts in the last, last supplemental for Ukraine. It was overwhelming in the House and the Senate. I don't expect that to yeah. change. Okay. So um, it's 26 days until the midterms. That means it's something like 755 <laughs> days to uh, to the 2024 yeah, presidential the election. Right so we're, it's not too early to start talking about that. Um, I, I guess. Um, uh, okay, great. Um, wanted to turn to the the uh, 2024 presidential <clears throat> election and how you see that sort of gearing. I've, I had uh, breakfast the other day with Karl Rove, and one of the things that we were talking about was, you know, he's like, you know, you can't discount 
ambition amongst po- politicians, yeah, yeah, obviously, yeah, yeah. right? So if somebody there's thinks the they've got, I use. yeah, if, if, we probably got up on one another. I can't remember who. If, if yeah. there's somebody who thinks they've got a two or three percent <clears throat> chance of winning the yeah. presidency, they're running, especially if the, the sort of the window of opportunity for their bully pulpit is going to close. Um, and so, you know, do you? I, I guess, how do you see the, the Trump factor um, going into this right now? And is it is would it dissuade? any of these other he, he, candidates. He's going to try and intimidate people out of the race as long as he can. Um, the way I look at running a party based on fear and intimidation ends kind of the way Hemingway talked about bankruptcy. It's gradual and then it's sudden drop. I think people will delay their decisions and they'll wait for somebody else to take the first plunge, to take the ire of Trump, to have him go after that person and try and you know hurt them with MAGA voters, so then they can follow in behind. And so it's sort of a prisoner's dilemma. Yeah. But the person who gets in the race earlier uh, can organize earlier, can sign up supporters earlier, can sign up donors earlier, can get a better jump on it. So it really is a total prisoner's dilemma. And like Carl said, you can always the one the one inexhaustible power in politics is ambition. You can count on that. There's a handful of people that are going to run because it's really the only cycle they can run in. They can't wait till 2028. They've got to go now if they're ever going to go, and they don't want to die not ever trying. Yeah. So there's a, you know, a handful of people like that. So, plus, I think Trump's unelectability will be palpable by then. We all know that he will lose, or he's, let, let me put it this way. We all know that he's so much more likely to lose the White House than anybody else running for president on our side of the aisle. So why would we want to go with that? So the only reason he stays where he is because everybody's afraid of him. They're afraid of him, you know, going after them, hurting their own ambition. But as soon as you get sort of the herd mentality going, it's, it's unstoppable. So I think, I think the fact that he polls so much poorer than anybody else running for president as a Republican against a Democrat is, is enough right there. He's gonna know this. And so whether he runs or not, I don't really know if it matters. He's not going to be the nominee, I don't think. I don't. That's, right. that's my view, and I think we're on a, on a pretty clear straight line pro- trajectory there. It's not like he's going to reverse his impression that suburban voters have on him. <laughs> that's, that cake is baked. Right. Right. So I think, I think it's going to be somebody other than Trump. The question is, are there so many non-Trump people running that they divide up that vote so much and that he gets it? You know, because he gets his 22 percent or whatever. That's the one big out, outstanding right. question, I think. But I think you'll see enough of a consolidation in, in the um, primary that that's probably not the case. And do you think that, you know, um, uh, obviously everybody's focused on DeSantis and Youngkin and, yeah. and Vice President Pence, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But as you look at the array of elections that are about to take place now in the states, governorships and so on. So are you expecting any sort of superstars yeah, to emerge? I don't know. That's a good out question. Um, all those guys you mentioned are good friends of mine. Yeah. Uh, I don't do see. I don't know what he's thinking about. There, there are probably a Chris Sununu is going to be probably very well reelected, popular guy up in New Hampshire. My guess is there are going to be a couple names they're not thinking about that enter the fray. Got it. So there's a couple of things I want to finally uh, uh, wind up on, and I want to change subjects here a little bit, and maybe have you take your your political hat off, but just put the hat on of being in the position of leadership in Congress. Um, as you know, I mean, you're vice chairman of Teneo. Um, major American corporations spend a lot of time making sure that their voice is heard in Washington, want to make sure that that voice is heard effectively. And I wonder if there are some sort of, you know, common misperceptions or common mistakes, even if you, if you will, that you see a lot of companies. So here you are, yeah. you're the Speaker of the House or you're the, or you're the chairman of major committees that are, that are relevant to these companies. You know, your day, I suspect, is planned from the moment your eyes open to the moment they go to, you go to bed. How is, is, is there, are there, are there kind of best practice ideas yeah. that aren't necessarily always intuitive that you think corporate Americans, CEOs in partic- particular, ought to know? Yeah, so my, my days were planned in 15 minute increments when I was in Congress. I'm not even embellishing, they were literally planned in 15 minute increments. Um, you have so much more demand for your time than you have supply of it. The more senior a member of Congress is, the more that, that pronounced that effect becomes. And so, just give you an example of, of when, when I'm doing schedule surgery with my scheduling team, you'd have, I don't know, let's just say you have 
an hour a week to dedicate to meeting with CEOs out of you know all of your time. Are you going to meet with the senior VP of you know personnel or the CFO of a company um, when you can't meet possibly all the CEOs that want to come and talk to you, or just the CEO? So if you're a senior member of Congress, if it's a request from a lower level um, executive, not from your district, you won't take it because you just don't have time. Right. And you'll you'll meet with the CEO because that you know that that's the decision maker. That's the person with the, with the vision of a company who makes decisions. So frankly, you're just not going to take the time to meet with a lower level person. It's not an arrogance thing. It's just a time efficiency thing. So I guess my point is, out of sight, out of mind. If CEOs don't go to government and, and talk directly with the policymakers, those policymakers probably won't hear their perspective, period. So you can't just outsource all of that stuff. Now, newer rank, rank and file members of Congress don't have such an incredible demand on their time like, like senior people do, and they probably have more time to meet with you know, a, 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 an officer of the company that's not the CEO. But generally speaking, the demands on members of Congress time is so high that you, it really does have to be, especially if it's not a constituent company. You know, I've met with the, you know, Harley Davidson, they could send anybody and I'll meet with them, you know, or a cheese right, producer sure. from yeah, Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, some company that's not from my area, I just, you know, you just don't have the time. So I think it's, it's out of sight, out of mind. You got to be there. And CEOs need to put the time in, develop some relationships, develop some friendships, particularly with, with members of Congress that are in charge of the jurisdiction that they care about in law. And don't try to have a friendship when you need it. Have the friendship right. when you don't need it, right. so that when you have some issue or problem, you already have a relationship with somebody. So they actually they trust you that the advice that you're giving them or the the, the petition you're making, they, they take it more seriously. Members of Congress discount accordingly when someone's telling them things, but if but if they have a better trusted relationship, it's just human nature. They're gonna they're gonna respond more accordingly. Right. And do you think, I mean, it's, it feels like there's been a, something of a shift in, in Washington, uh, particularly the showboaters on both sides of the aisle uh, rushing to be as loud as they possibly can and kind of anti-corporate yeah. America, anti-CEO yeah. um, and, 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 and all of this. And, you know, I, I'm wondering, you know, obviously CEOs have different constituents beyond Washington and beyond the electorate. They've got their employees. They've got their customers. They've got the international markets that they're sh that they're. But there seems to be a lot of pressure for them to opine on just about everything, even if it's yeah. not day-to-day -day relevant to their business, perhaps. It, it, it is, um, should they, how, what would you recommend here? Uh, I mean, two, I feel like they're getting caught in a lot of traps. Two things. Number one, uh, to answer both the last question and this question, um, it's, it's not always the best to go to Washington to meet with a member of Congress. Have that member of Congress go to your factory in their district and meet you there. Right. Meet your employees. Me, you know, that thing. So if, if you have any touch, let's just say it's an Ohio person, you have Ohio facilities, try to have a meeting with that person at your Ohio factory with that Ohio congressman or senator. That's really good and important thing to do. Far more lasting impression will be made that way. The second thing is I, CEOs regrettably, I think, have to think more like politicians these days because they're, when they make public statements, they're basically being a politician. And you have a constituency that may be your employees or you have a constituency that may be some of your customers, but you have to recognize every time you make a public pronouncement that of any kind of controversy whatsoever, that, that statement's gonna ping around many yeah. different constituencies and how it's gonna shake out, you don't know. Right. But you better premeditate all of that, think it through. That's what politicians do. And a politician thinks through all the second, third, fourth knock-on effects of a, of a decision or, or a statement and how it moves around the political chessboard Regrettably, I don't think CEOs are trained to think like that. This day and age, I think they do need to think like that. And, and at, when you shake all of that out, that means sort of just a little less commentary would be probably helpful. Kind of stay down the middle of the highway um, and don't, don't, do, don't, don't pop off on the latest emotional reaction to something. And the thing I would do is buy yourself some political capital by premeditating a cause you care about, something that's important that, that speaks to your values and your, your stakeholder values, go do that. Go focus on that and, and, and really get a lot of attention on that so that you can buy yourself some political capital to maybe sit out two or three fights that are coming down the pike. Because if you get in the reps of responding to everything, yeah. then when you don't respond, it's actually responding. And you got to be careful about that. So I want to end on this. Um, one of the things that's always struck me about you talking to you in the past is... Uh, uh, and hearing you speak publicly um, is you're at heart a very optimistic guy. 
Um, Life's better that way. Yeah, and um, and yet uh, mm -hmm. you know as well as the rest of us do that when you kind of turn on the TV right now and you know you look at the condition uh, of 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 the country, you look at polarization, you look at the way that we are, you know, you're. I mean, we're living in a world right now where the average American would rather have their children, you know, mm -hmm. marry somebody of a different race or a different religion than somebody of a different uh, political yeah. party, yeah. right? The the political discourse, I mean, and the, the, the approval ratings of institutions that have typically been highly respected, including the Supreme Court, are at all-time all -time lows, only sort of the Defense Department remains, uh, remains with, with high approval ratings. Um, and yet, you know, this country that's founded on an ideal, <laughs> The only one in the world that is. Um, we've got to get ourselves together here. But what can cattle? What? Where? Where's the? Yeah. Where's the beacon of, of of optimism? I think here? good leadership at the end of the day gets it. We haven't had it. Uh, look, Trump was a hyper polarizing figure. Biden chose to throw in with an ideological base in his party, which you know was not what the moderates that voted for him thought they were going to get. So we've been pinging around, you know, ideological leadership. And I'm not saying it's all the president's fault. It's not. That's just a big contributing factor. The problem is we have digitally, you know, polarized our country. We have there is a incentive structure to tribalize America through the digital lives we live. That's a serious problem. I don't think there's an easy answer around it other than hopefully the political incentive structure can turn to the point where there's so much polarization fatigue, um, you know, impasse fatigue that we actually can have um, kind of a, Ra I call it a Reagan 2.0 moment, not just a person, but a time where we realize we got so much more in common than we don't as, as just Americans, as people who want, you know, our kids to do well and the future to be bright and our problems to be solved. And uh, we have this social contract that we all basically agree on. So let's go fix it. And, and, and by the way, democracy and liberty and freedom and self-determination is a whole lot better than the tyranny that they, these guys have in other countries. So let's go heal it and build it. I think, I think there's going to be another chapter where that is going to be cool again, where the political incentive structure is to champion that again. And then the, the political prize goes to the person who best does that. I, I think we got another chapter like that. Look, Churchill said it the best way, I think. The Americans can be counted upon to do the right thing, but only after they've exhausted all the other possibilities. I think we're kind of playing that thing out. Well, thanks for this. Really appreciate it. Paul Ryan, the former uh, Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives and now the Vice Chairman of Teneo. Thank you very much for joining us. Please join us for our next edition of Teneo Insights soon. Until then, I'm Kevin Kajawara in New York.